so um, to, yeah, so today again, uh, these these last few chapters that that were in terms of in Romans, the the work that Saint Paul has given, are meant to be much more practical. Um, last week we focused on our relationships with other Christians, how we are meant to be community and how we are meant to support one another. Today, St. Paul looks outside of the community, um, specifically in terms of looking at our, how we um, relate to and interact with the, th the authorities around us, um, for the most part. So, um, yeah, potentially, this could be a, a good conversation. I have actually, before you leave today, I actually have three handouts because I'm thinking that, so not only my notes, but then two, um, uh, one, uh, two handouts that relate to two topics I think are going to need a little bit more background that, than I, I have or want to give in the conversation today. So, all right, <clears throat> so with that, um, we're still in this whole living life of faith um, section, and let us pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you will renew the face of the earth. Lord, by the light of the Holy Spirit, you have taught the hearts of your faithful, in the same spirit, help us to relish what is right and always rejoice in your consolations. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, and uh, uh, one, again, in the, the, you know, I should be deep in prayer and thinking only of the Lord, but it's in those moments that little tidbits pop into my brain. I will have a calendar for uh, the summer study next week. Okay. Okay, so um, we are looking at um, chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, and we're looking at the submission of authority, uh, of you know, how, we, how we are to interact with, the author with authorities. So um, Marcia is our reader today. Let every person be subordinate to the higher authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority opposes what God has appointed, and those who oppose it will bring judgment upon, upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear to good conduct, but to evil. Do you wish to have no fear of authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive approval from it. For it is a servant of God for your good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword without purpose. It is the servant of God to inflict wrath on the evildoer. Therefore, it is necessary to be subject, not only because of the wrath, but also because of conscience. This is why you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Pay to all their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, toll to whom toll is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. Okay. There got to be some thoughts on the, on 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 all that. Yes, ma'am. Verse five. So read it again. Um, okay, so uh, in, for those who didn't hear, the tr in her translation of verse 5, it says, uh, uh, basically, obey the laws because you know you should, and then 
then, uh, oh, uh, and because you know you will be punished. Oh, punishment first, and yeah. okay. Um, so, uh, and you're just showing how you're how mature you are, and and and, and <laughs> yes. Uh, see, I don't know whether I would be insulted because everybody laughed at that. <laughs> no, they. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the. the um, so uh, uh, this is this is this is a moment when actually when I was preparing my, my Bible for this for this Bible study, um, I thought, oh great, those thousands of dollars of, uh, that I, I put into my master's degree, I could I I, I have a reason for that now. <laughs> um, teachers in the room, um, and actually, if you did any kind of healthcare uh, in terms of studying development. And children, Lawrence Kohlberg. Does that ring a bell? Okay. So there's a gen so back in the a uh, little bit a little bit of background. Whether, whatever you think of Sigmund Freud, one of the things that Sigmund Freud brought into the world of psychology and sociology and and de is the idea that we we have segments and we develop over time. Okay. He became the father of what is now known as developmental psychology. And in developmental psychology, it, it, um, Eric Erickson, um, psychosocial in terms of how we, you know, when you're, when you're one year old, this is how you interact, and when you're five year old, this is how you interact. Well, in that whole genre, in that school, there is a gentleman by the name of, of Dr. Lawrence Kohlberg. He actually, um, yeah, so he, what he looked at is moral development. Why do we choose to do the things we choose when we do them, okay? Um, those of us who are old enough will remember, could, might remember that there, there were studies being done where they took these children from when they were, when they were very, very young and, and then they studied them over like 50 years. And they would ask them these moral questions like, um, uh, and I can't, obviously, because of today, I'm not going to be able to think of one, but um, a question that cannot be, it, there is no definitive right answer. Um, and then, and from that, he extrapolated that there are, are six stages of moral development, okay? And long-winded, I'm coming to an answer. Um, long-winded way, though. Um, and. Uh, since that, there have been some of his grad students have since um, modified his work, but it comes down to this, that <clears throat> when you are very young, we, immorally speak, excuse me, morally speaking, and young does not necessarily mean chronological age, it means um, psychological, social age. When we are young, we make the choice, for the most part, because we don't want to get punished, okay? Uh, there's more to it, but it's like, I, I fear punishment. Um, another reason that we choose, and this is, tends to be a, a, a more female um, reason than a male reason, because we want to be the good girl, you know? We want to be seen as a good girl. Um, uh, another reason is because the law tells us to do this. That tends to be a more male reason. But what we're moving towards is a universal good. We choose to do something because this, regardless of, of, of the individuals it affects, there is a universal principle here, a universal good that we need to seek. Now, St. Paul was ahead of his time. So when he says, when this translation about making the choice to our conscience as opposed to because because, uh, read it again. Obey the laws then for two reasons. First, to keep from being punished. And second, just because you know you should. So, you know, that kind of fits into that, that moral development is, and St. Paul is realizing, some people are going to do stuff just because they, they don't want to get punished for it. 
Um, I, and I'm sure it will continue throughout my life that how many people go to church and, and, and do what they're supposed to do because they don't want to end up in hell, you know? They don't want to be punished. Um, but we're, we are meant to continue to nurture and develop ourselves so that we get to that point where we're doing this because we know this is what we're meant to do. You know, that, we, that there is a reason behind it, and, and that reason is the foundation from, for, by which, like, okay, going back to Mass. <clears throat> yes, are there days that I go to Mass because I know, because um, I don't want to go to hell. Like holy days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like holy days. Um, or, uh, but the, I, I, I hope this continues. The, the vast majority of the reasons that I go to Mass is because I want to honor and, and show God my love. I want to be in the presence of God. Um, my conscience tells me that's the right place to be. So um, St. Paul is just ahead of his time. He recognizes that people do things for a variety of reasons. And, and one of those reasons is they, they are afraid to get punished, which will kind of fill into some of the other parts of the conversation. Yeah. The second part is the personal. The societal reason keeps us functioning as a group. Right. Because we have to have norms that we can live by. Right. And if we have no fear of punishment, why do anything that we don't want to do? <laughs> which is, which uh, explains a lot of the chaos we're living with today. You know, that there are a lot of people um, who do. Um, are doing a lot of stuff and they do it because they believe that they're not going to be punished for it. Um, uh, I, I have read a couple of articles of, uh, after the insurrection and uh, the failed insurrection, thanks be to God, um, that they, it, their belief was that even if they failed, they would get, still get off scot-free, you know. So it, 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 there, it, you're absolutely right. And, and St. Paul is kind of making that point in regards to um, talking about capital punishment, but we'll kind of come to that later, that um, some, you know, uh, some people, uh, well, quite frankly, there's a lot of things, I, I don't want to go to jail, <laughs> you know? So I'm not going to break the law, even though it's, sometimes it's tempting to, you know? Maureen, oh, I'm sorry, Maureen, Maureen her hand up and then Roger, I'll get to you. I think I was itching my nose. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, Roger. Um, I was scratching my chin, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Okay, no, no more scratching body parts, okay? No, go ahead. You know, one of the things, one of the reasons I think a lot of people go to church is you feel good when you go there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know, I, you know, why we, we're, we're not under any obligation to come here for Bible study. Why do we come here for Bible study? It feels good. Yeah. It's really the community. Yeah, yeah. That's right. The community. Our, our former um, church people have uh, get together for rosary. Again, it's no obligation, but two dozen people show up every month and they show up because they feel good. Which is why, but again, why the church obligates us to be at mass because of all those different things peop, there's a, there are a lot of people who won't go if they if if there is not a rule that there's a lot of people who don't go even if there is again a because they've been told that there is there is no final punishment um, you know for that um, they're one of the travesties of catechesis um, for a period of time was a lot of being told that there is no hell, you know, there and and uh, there will be no final punishment. Okay, well, or you know, um, it's all relative or whatever. And so a lot of people there, and I'm not suggesting that we get back to fire and brimstone where we're we're pounding people over the head with the fear of God. Um, I personally like that we, we have come to remember that God is a loving God and a merciful God and a forgiving God. Um, but it, that a lot of people are, I, I, why go to church? 
Nothing's happening to me. Nothing's happening to me. People so. will say, uh, oh, are you talking about punishment? They'll say, oh, that's all Old Testament, Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. And I'll say, you better read the book of Revelation. Yes, and the Gospels. Well, there are people that don't believe in purgatory either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, this coming weekend, um, I, my bullet, my you know, mini catechism bulletin article is on purgatory that Roger inspired. So I didn't inspire. I just asked. You went, well. You would ask the question. So I got a sneak preview of it too. Yeah. Was it acceptable? Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah. On obedience to authority, is law another word for authority? Um, so what verse are you looking at? Oh, 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 oh. No, they're, 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 um, uh, yes and no. I mean, authority, authority speaks through the law, but St. Paul here, um, when he speaks of authority, he's talking about the men and women who are in our government, in our, our military, or, or, or in, to some degree, our bosses. Um, those people that that have a responsibility to manage um, not only a situation but the people around them. Well, then my next question would be, and that's on verse one. It says, "There's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been established by God." Right. Yeah. And I struggle with some of the laws, like the laws on abortion. Um, and and so did everybody hear the question? Yeah, um, for the, the sake of the camera, um, verse one in terms of that that you know there is no authority except from God, and though so in my my um, I did my edition of the Bible, let every person be subject to the govern, governing authorities, for there is no no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God, um, and and which. I want to take that as one piece, and the, but the second part of the question has to do with, well, when those authorities are um, creating laws that are counter to what we know to be true in faith. Um, and so, um, uh, so the first part of that, I, I, I'm sorry, I, can't, I think it was in chapter 8, 7, 8, somewhere in there, uh, of Romans. We had, St. Paul was talking about how... Um, God has given us those people to rule over us. You know, that, that all authority comes from God. Um, that, you know, God is the ultimate authority, but the kings and the queens and, and, and in our democratic society, the presidents and the senators, and the, though in St. Paul's mind, in, um, in understanding the whole picture, um, because God has a finger in the process, they are there because God wants them to be there. Let me just stop there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You don't have to agree with it at this point, but does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, it, it, is, it would be like, um, uh, uh, so <clears throat> um, as the director of religious education, um, I asked Ellen to teach seventh grade. So by my authority, she has authority in the classroom. Now, did the kids respect that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know you did. I know you did. The, the, uh, uh, the, the, point, being, the point being here is that, um, okay, well, let me, so if, in understanding that, we have to also remember our conversation about uh, salvation history. Now, I, maybe it's just me, but I'm thinking, okay, God orchestrated salvation history, so everything should be ordered to the good, right? Everything should be right. We know in our own lives, at least I know in my own life, when bad things happen to me, they sometimes and oftentimes teach me more than when the good stuff happens. And so, and, and it, I, I cannot think of the, um, um, the, the citation, but 
um, in scripture it says God takes crooked lines and makes them straight. So the bad stuff that hap has happened in salvation history gave birth to a lot of good stuff happening. Example being um, Caesar calling the, for the, um, uh, uh, the census which forced Joseph to take Mary to Bethlehem so that the, the prophecy could be fulfilled that the Messiah would be, be born in Bethlehem. Okay? It's not something we want to think uh, that our God would allow uh, for horrible situations to occur, but we, we have to remember that there is the permissive will of God, that God allows things to happen, but in that allowing, good things draw out of that. So take that, put the two together, you know, St. Paul is, is telling us all authority comes from God. Good, bad, indifferent, but it comes from God. So if it comes from God, our initial, and this is me adding to the conversation, our initial response needs to, to say, okay, this is from God. So how do I react to that? How do I interact with that? Um, Rather than listening to all the whispers and the gossip, gossip of, of how this person is going to just destroy whatever, I need to stop and just let things happen and see, you know, um, um, uh, it's like confetti being thrown in the air. I got to let everything fall to the ground first and see and then make a decision. So let me just stop there. Does that make sense? Does everybody, does anybody yeah. want to push back against that? Because now I'm thinking... You know, even though I don't believe in abortion, the good from it is strengthens my face in, in the sanctity of life. Exactly, exactly. That so, uh, but I want to come back to the to that uh, to abortion and other civil disobedience. Um, that the uh, but the, but the truth is is that sometimes someone not sometimes the 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 probability of someone taking a stance counter to what we believe is going to force us to rethink and go gee a what do i really believe how you know and then what com comes out of that is now i've got to do some research and and now i've got to so my just a personal story that uh, it, that counters that um when so you know, you all know my background, and, and one of the things that you may or may not have picked up in this late, later part of my life, I could be a bit of a feminist, you know, a very <laughs> kind of a feminist, especially when it comes to um, the church and the way the church functions at times. And um, a rebel, I guess that's a better way, not a feminist, but more, a little bit rebellious. And um, uh, back in like the early 1990s, um, my family, my husband and my daughter and I established ourselves in a parish where, hello, Father. <laughs> of course, he's going to come in just what I'm talking about. <laughs> my rebelling against authority. <laughs> Let's say again. What the seed is, children, you have very attentive to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and St. Paul, and Saint Paul is telling us, and, and it, it, it does, the story does come out right, because, um, uh, so I don't know if you want to hear the story, if, if you want to say hello to everybody, or, you know, you're a busy man. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, just wait till the end. That's all I ask you, wait till the end. So when, when I, um, uh, so we, we establish ourselves in this new parish and there in the midst of the liturgy, the, the priest who was a very learned liturgist um, um, asked the community to, um, uh, to stand during the Eucharistic prayers, okay? And my first sense was, this is not right. <clears throat> and um, so I, you know, I, Again, I went and I started doing some research and, and reading. And this all led to, to my calling a, um, a priest friend of mine who I had a great deal of respect for, a deeply learned man, and, and saying, 
you know, Father Bob, I, this is what's going on, help me. And so we, we talked about what I'd learned and what I'd read, and, and, and his final comment to me was, Teresa, you know, you have issues with authority. <laughs> and what, maybe what God is calling you to is obedience in this moment. So this, she had made the comment that sometimes authority, you know, huh? Listen, yes, yeah. And that's what St. Paul is teaching, is that, that uh, the first part of this conversation is if we understand that authority comes from God, all authority comes from God, then our responsibility is to stand first in, in recognition and honoring and respecting that authority. But there's more to the conversation, but uh, that's what... You know what that reminds I, me when you... Oh, wait, wait, Father wants to I say something. I remember a funny story when she says, listen to the authority. Our body, our body, the organ of having an argument with the greatest group of patients, oh. with the authority. So the brain says, I am the one. And <laughs> I think right or wrong. I am the one. No, no, you are not the one. So the eye says, I am the one who sees and then you know you are able to assume that thing. I am the one. No, no, no. And then the mouth, the tongue, everybody said. The ear also said, ah, I love you. Then you know. <laughs> the asshole said, I am the authority. <laughs> no, you are not the authority. Okay, I am not the authority. Yeah, so block. <laughs> <laughs> block. First day, second day, third day, fourth day. Okay. No vision, no hearing, <laughs> no thinking, no right thinking because when you are not having motion, definitely all the poison goes back to yeah. the brain. Everything stops. <laughs> Finally, they say, hey, you want to <laughs> I love it. <laughs> the moral of the story is any as well as authority you have listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Father. <laughs> and then good Lord in the life of sorry sorry, in the life of Saint Francis of Assisi, mm -hmm. obedience was the greatest uh, of the three evangelical virtues. So Francis of Assis used to order the brothers to go and plant that plant opposite down, upside down. And the brothers would not question. They plant upside down. And eat to blow some. In the life of St. Antony, Antony Padua, he was a gardener because in the, after once he returned back, he was, in, I think, remotely or remote, one another. On the seacoast region in Italy, mm -hmm. he was lodging more than six months or six years. His superior told him, you cannot go on talking to people for finding miracles. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, he said. One day, he was working in the garden. In the next uh, apartment, they were, there was a scaffolding. A man was working on the scaffolding. He lost the balance, mm -hmm. he was going to fall. And as he was coming down, he said, hang on, let me get permission from my authority. <laughs> <laughs> and he did hang there in the air. He went and asked the permission from the authority. Authority gave him permission. And that was the holiness of life. Yeah. So when you submit yourself to the plan of the superior, whatever it may be, God will handle it. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt your question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Feminism and authority. I saw the movie Cabrini oh. this weekend. Oh, how many people have saw the movie Cabrini? Okay. It's showing at the Farmington Civic for 575. Yeah, I don't know how long it'll be there, but... The Civic, yeah. That so, which I, and I haven't seen the movie, but I know a little bit of the story, and and that that awesome. it, there there is the other side to submission, mm -hmm. and and uh, but I want before we move on to that, I in terms of because I want to get back to have you know 
the issue of abortion or um, um, civil rights or things like that, but it, just in terms of generally submission and authority and, and such. It's interesting that he said that because the order that he comes from, I found out from a deacon, that isn't that their philosophy, you just, um, you just trust God, trust God, trust God. And that's how he handles probably being here and having to leave. He's trusting God that all will be fine. It's a, it's a profound thing to be that humble. Well, and, and it, it, it makes the point that in, in, within all religious communities, um, something that as lay people we don't have the opportunity to, um, um, to benefit from is that their, that sense of authority, they do, uh, most of them will, will say, um, that they are there in terms of it as an act of God. And it, it, so as to teach the novitiate, the, those in the novitiate or the early years, to submit to God's authority. That I practice submitting to God's authority by practicing, by submitting to your authority. And, and, I, and I, you know, that, that might be something that, that we all need a little bit more in our lives. <coughs> um, but yeah, it's the, 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 the yeah, I'm just gonna, yeah, yeah. Um, any, anything else? Okay, so, but there is another side to this. And um, um, that St. Paul, what St. Paul is not saying, and what St. Paul is not saying uh, is the fact that if the authority is asking us to do something that is against God's law, such as taking the life of, the, of innocence, such as um, having a complete disregard for the humanity of other individuals, such as um, the civil rights movement um, that, that many of us um, are, are at least aware of, um, all of us should be aware of, <coughs> that we have a responsibility to speak truth to power. That, that, what did the prophets do? They spoke truth to power, you know. So it, we, we cannot just um, allow, you know, it, we're not in our being respectful and honoring the authority that's in our lives, it does not be, mean becoming a, um, uh, so submissive that we allow everything and anything to happen to us. Okay, that makes sense? Mm -hmm. um, I remember reading, um, uh, actually it was a controversial book, can't think of the name of it now, uh, in terms of looking at the Holocaust. Why did the Holocaust happen? Why did so many Jews march into, um, into the, the chambers? And this one, it was a series of editorial um, articles, and this one article made the comment that, it, that for many Jews, that the idea of being submissive to authority was so ingrained in them that they did not, they didn't, they just, okay. This is, God has put this person in charge of my life, and therefore I am going to go up against that. Um, I'm not going to go up against that, excuse me, and, and allowed, allowed this atrocity to happen. Um, but I, yeah. Any other comments, questions about those first two verses? The first verse, yes? Yeah. And what you were describing uh, with the Nazis, they were illegitimate. Although illegitimate in, in terms of how they were, what they were doing, but they were legitimate in that the people had elected them, had put Hitler into power. 
and and that uh, the article that uh, on um, that one of the two articles, the the priest who wrote the article makes the comment, here in the United States, we have we have the the privilege, and the power, to make our own leaders, because we vote for them, you know, and if we don't have if if someone who is in office, um, it's not. Is, is acting illegitimately in regards to our faith, um, our faith principles, then we have a responsibility to not just complain about, rah, 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 look, what, look what she's doing now. Rah, 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 rah. We have a responsibility to do something about that, and one of our primary ways of doing that is, is working to vote them out of office. You know? um, so it, the, the, I understand what you're saying in terms of the actions they're taking, but that actually makes my point. It, that if, if the leadership, the authority that is over us is doing something they shouldn't be doing, then we need to do, we have a responsibility through the call, through our, our baptismal call to do something about that. Not only in terms of, of civil federal government, but in terms of, of any power or authority we see ruling in our lives. Well, we, we also have to realize that everybody's opinion about what is legitimate and illegitimate is fluid. <laughs> and, and you're absolutely right. And the, the key word there is opinion. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, I've, I've, I've shared this multiple times. This is why I do not, in this day and age, I do not um, use any media to make my decision about who to vote for. Mm -hmm. Because, well, I do look at the, women, the League of Women Voters, <laughs> you know. You. You're welcome. Um, because they post what the voting records of these individuals. I look to those things. How, what was this person like before they even got into office? And then now that they're in office, um, if they are in office, how did they vote? Because in our day and age, we have gotten to the point that everything is opinion. Even the news is, is a projection of someone's opinion, whether it's the, the person who is giving the newscast or more likely it is their bosses. You know, they, they have, a, have an agenda and they want that agenda to, to be pushed forward. Um, and so it, what you're, you're right, you cannot, um, uh, look at what look at a particular person uh, in terms of authority, and and just because someone said they did this or done, you know that, um, uh, uh, I, I've had that happen to me multiple times in terms of of someone not liking a decision I made, and therefore telling everybody around them what a horrible individual I was. And of course, you all know that to be true, <laughs> but the the. You know, the reality is that, okay, that's your opinion, but, but please, and I've had that happen to where someone um, jaded some, me towards someone because I walked into a situation where I didn't know the individual and I, I started the, the job and I had one of the staff people come up and say, okay, you don't want to work with this person, this person, and this person. Oh, because yada, 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 and they did yada, 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 and they did yada, yada, yada. Well, so I took that to be God's truth, and I, I acted on it, only to find out later that it was a personality clash, and I had no problems with these individuals. And I learned from that that I never did that again. I, I just would, like you're all doing, nod in my head and said, okay. And then I just went and let that person show me who they were, so. Um. That's the problem with gossip. Yeah, that is the problem with gossip. Like yeah. The, the, I, what, I don't know what you call it. Reputation. Reputation. Yeah, that, that, um, that's why, you know, a lot of people, they use the Ten Commandments as their examination of conscience. And, and they get to, I, I, um, I didn't murder anyone. But, you know, my challenge is, did you gossip? Because you have destroyed to somewhat their, their reputation. 
I like listening to Ave Maria Radio. Mm -hmm. Teresa Tamio was in the secular media, and then the God letter to Ave Maria Radio. And the other day she was talking about, you know, all the news. It's not journalism anymore. It's no. an opinion, and many times you just read the main headline, and you don't read through the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then again, most people don't read anymore yeah. either. Yeah. You're right. They get their opinion from... And yeah. and they and or not even fr from TV. Uh, uh, the younger generation is from the internet, and and we've talked about how in terms of media that um, these algorithms that you 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 start a search and then you if you all of a sudden all these other posts start popping up and you could go down this rabbit hole, and uh, um, and some very intelligent people, uh, very moral people, could make some really stupid decisions. In my opinion, um, on the internet it's got to be correct, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's on the internet. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Um, uh, just because I'm aware of time, is there any? I want to. We we have yeah. See, you were thinking 14 chapters. How are we gonna? The, we're gonna be done in 10 minutes. Um, is there any other? In before I I kind of walk through this section, is there any other um, thing that struck you, struck you that? you want to bring up before we walk? Okay, so just as a, as a, um, a review, um, let everyone be subjected to government authority. There is no authority except that which God has established. So we have to keep that in mind um, that, that God acts through us here in the United States to establish um, mayors and governors and senators and presidents and and um, all of that uh, in in our world and so we we have a responsibility um, to first allow them to show us who they are you know to and you know there 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 are a lot of people in authority that I don't have a lot of respect for and I will not they shall remain nameless but if I was ever in their presence, because of their role in that authority, except maybe one or two, um, I would show them the respect of, of their office, you know, um, because that's what we're called. Because I do recognize that God has put you here. For whatever reason, God has put you here. Um, the authorities that exist have been established by God. Uh, and then we talked about how, okay, that being true, the, the other side of that is that we are meant to know our faith so well that when what they are asking for us to do or to believe is counter to what we know to be the truth of God, that we can't do this. So we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to, and as it says here, uh, speak truth to power. And I love the second part of the quote, even if your voice shakes, you know. Um, because uh, oftentimes, um, I know for myself, when I've, had, when I've been in that situation when I've had to confront uh, a power with truth, um, it was, I didn't walk in there, you know, I'm, you know, the Hulk, I'm going to, I'm going to, I have yeah, strength. It was, I was shaken in my boots. Um, yeah. Okay, so this comes from that article that I, I was telling you about. We here in the U.S. bear greater responsibility because we, we have more than just the opportunity to speak to our kings or our rulers, who, those in government authority. We have a duty to choose them, an opportunity that the people in Scripture never had and many throughout the world don't have. And if our system of governance works the way it's supposed to work, we, in fact, govern ourselves. Okay? You know, it's something to think about, and it, and um, and I would really highly recommend that if you don't pick up the other, that you do pick up this, um, as we are uh, once again coming into another presidential uh, election process, that you know, we have we have a responsibility, and 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 if we we can say, well, I didn't vote for that person, yeah, but but did you do anything? to support your candidate to make sure that other people were aware of the good that that person was. So, and, and, and I realize before anybody says it, oftentimes it's the taking the lesser of two evils. I get it, I get it, um, but even so. 
Um, uh, so uh, uh, just as a couple of uh, scriptural supports um, of what, why St. Paul is saying this, this comes from Daniel. Blessed be the name of, of God from age to age, for wisdom and power are his. He, he changes times, seasons, deposes kings, and set up kings. Um, and then this is from Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah. See, today I appoint you over nations, over kingdoms, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And just, as in, re and just in reading that, it occurred to me, so the king of Babylon... God, you know, in our understanding that God established that authority, um, the, the, compare the king of Babylon and the king of Syria. So, you know, what did that king do? That, the king of Syria, inter, you know, he took the, the he conquered um, the Israelites and, and carted them off and there was intermarriage and they were, you know, they, he muddied the waters of their heritage, whereas the king of Babylon respected it. You know, God placed that king there so that, that the dynasty of, of the Jews would be maintained in respect. Um, and without the quotes, but a summation of Isaiah, God uses human history, both good and bad, to bring about his plan for our salvation. Um, and then this is taken from the Catholic commentary on sacred scripture. Um, and this, this here, oh, you know, this is where, where we... Um, this, okay, you know, verse 2, oh, actually, okay, let's go back. So verse 2, um, resisting authority. Um, if we resist authority, we resist God, but that only in terms of if, if they're doing the right stuff. Um, and then verses 3 and 4, um, St. Paul is asking the question, um, what is the purpose of authority? You know, um, uh, let's see, thir verses three and four. Um, for rulers, okay, so for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. And um, would you have no fear of him uh, who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant, this is assuming kings, you know, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, and I always want to be very afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Um, he is the servant of God to execute his wrath on wrongdoers. So the Catholic Church, in its understanding and support of capital punishment, this is what one of their reference points is this. Because when St. Paul is talking about the sword, he is talking about someone um, uh, um, uh, doing something so wrong that the only just response is an equal response of retribution, such as murder. Okay? Um, and so that's where we get this next quote. Um, the question here is, what does Paul, St. Paul mean by the sword? According to some scholars, it symbolizes the power of government to enforce its laws by punishing infractions. According to others, it signals the government's right to use military force to maintain public order. According to others still, and this seems the most likely interpretation, the, the sword represents the authority of civil government to inflict capital punishment on society's most dangerous criminal delinquents. In this reading, govern, governing authorities are authorized by God to take lethal action against persons who pose a serious threat to the safety and the stability of the community. Okay. That's why there is a second article on, the, on capital punishment from the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops um, uh, that I, again, would highly recommend. Um, now... And uh, I, I, I do recognize and, and want to throw into the conversation that are there a lot of people who are on death row who are there unfairly, um, that they are innocent? Absolutely. Um, but there, and there is there still tension within the church itself in regards to having the right to, to kill? in such a case as capital punishment. 
Um, and that, that is one of those conversations, and Ellen, that we must discern, <laughs> <laughs> goes to an earlier conversation that we've had, but discernment in terms of our, our own um, viewpoints and, and, and if we feel the need to take actions and, and so forth. Um, but if you ask what the Catholic Church's teaching is on capital punishment, they're not going it, it doesn't say that it's for capital punishment, but it does recognize that God has given the authority to the government and the government, this is how the government chooses to act on. Okay. Mm, Maureen is over there groaning. Something, yeah, I got make sure you read the article. Yeah. Uh, and this is where, you know, I, I myself am still in the process of, dis of discernment. Uh, many of you will remember, uh, what, 20 years ago, the movie Dead Man Walking? Um, I actually knew that nun. I'd met that, the nun who was the, that, uh, uh, in Louisiana that, that um, I didn't know her personally. I mean, we had been at conferences together, and I, oh, hi, I'm Teresa, I'm, you know, sister. Um, uh, but that that whole situation really brought up a lot of conversation within the church itself but in general about is this a just thing to do is this something right to do so if if you want if you're looking for something dead man walk, walking read the book it's actually better than and um uh and the basis for those who don't know the basis of the story is um there was a young man on death row and uh he was looking for a someone a spiritual director someone who would be with him and pray with him and walk with him and so I, i'm trying sister june prejo prejo -E -E so sister prejo was was recommended and encouraged and she didn't have any, any real background in doing this um, but it she ended up getting involved in the situation with the family uh, this young man had killed um, a young lady in a very horrific way, and um, and yeah, it uh, it just, but it brought out the humanity of the moment that this would. It's not we can't see these individuals on death row as animals, you know. It's a person, and and we have to recognize what 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 we're doing. Um, okay. Any other any other comments? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Okay. Um, and then, um, yes, and then we get to, oh, and we, um, we, um, we, in verse five, we talked about in terms of, of that, you know, right thing to do. Um, verse six, yeah, I'm surprised no one had any comments about that. Verse six, for, for the same reason you are to pay taxes. All right. Just pay them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. That's why I thought this was very interesting. It would have been more interesting if this was last week's, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, pay taxes. And where, so St. Paul goes, uh, he goes on in verse 7, uh, <laughs> pay all of them. <laughs> Which, I, and, and in my own history, I, I, my immediate response was, and especially in light of the death of, um, um, Bishop Gumbleton, mm. um, but uh, more so, I coming from the Archdiocese of Seattle, I was in um, college, and and my uh, when Archbishop Hunthausen was was do anybody remember, remember that name? Um, he had he felt that nuclear um, armament was wrong, and in his one of his ways of protesting that was to only pay a percentage of his taxes because uh, the other percentage represented the monies that would get go into the military uh, yeah very controversial I don't want to get into the right and wrong of it but when it says pay all of them I thought I wonder if he ever meditated on that passage um, okay uh, tax so he, you know we in verse 7 pay all of them taxes to whom taxes are due so taxes are the direct expectation by government to financially support, for financial support. So we, our taxes go to, hopefully, 
the, the programming and the administration of, uh, of our, our cities and government. Um, and then the revenue to whom revenue is due. And revenue, another word for that is toll. Scholars understand this as those indirect taxes, so such as sales taxes um, that are attached to the flow of goods, okay? Um, and then respect to whom respect is due. Uh, and, you know, I, think, I don't think anybody needs to have the respect to find, but the attitude one holds in the presence of those who serve this country, civil and military speaking. And again, in my own reflection and study, I think back to the 1970s when, and 70s and 80s when so many of our, our young men were coming back from the Vietnam War and, and being spit on while they were in uniform. I, 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 my brother... Um, uh, joined the military in the, the late 70s, uh, mid to late 70s. And um, I remember we picked him up from the airport. Um, and at that time, I don't know if they still do this, at that time uh, you could fly commercial if you wore your uniform and there was an empty seat. And so he flew commercial, got the seat. Uh, when we were coming home, my dad wanted to stop and eat dinner someplace. And my brother said, no, let's go home. And then he talked about he needed this or that and the other thing. And my dad said, well, we'll stop at the grocery store. No, no, let's just go home. And finally, my dad said, why? He said, because I don't want to be someplace where someone is going to come up to me and spit on me. So, you know, they need to reflect on that. Um, and then the final, he says, honor to whom honor is due. And our actions and words regarding those who serve this country, civil and militarily speaking. And that's why even if we don't agree with someone, um, our faith is teaching us that, that because of the authority that they have been given through God, but more importantly because God is within them, to disrespect them means to disrespect God and God's authority. So we, we, we don't have to agree with them. We don't have to even talk to them. Um, but given that we are in a situation, we do need to at least respect them. All right. Anybody want the last word before we? Yes, ma'am. I just want to say in my Bible, instead of respect to whom respect is due, it says fear to whom fear is due. Oh, so rather than respect fear. Okay. Interesting. But my dad explained to me when he grew up that is the word that they used. Yeah, like right. Like you would fear your mom and dad, but it would be more, it's a respect thing. Yeah. I, I, it, it just didn't coordinate with the respecting yeah, no, it, there, there is a, uh, so what I, I think Ellen is telling us is that, uh, that for a long, long time, respect and fear were the same. You know, it, you, you, um, you, you showed respect because you feared the retribution you would get. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I look at parenting today and, and then, because I'm a big, I, I do enjoy period, move, you know, like Downton Abbey and, and you know, even uh, Mur um, Murdoch, Murdoch Mysteries, anybody who is, you know, turn of the, of the 18th and, or the 19th into the 20th century kind of stuff. And I look at how the interaction of child and parent, a lot of the reason they respect it is because they feared. Um, and it, yes, they are very different. Um, today we show res we, we don't necessarily fear someone we show respect to, but um, it's more of an, 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 a, a, an attitude, maybe you know, of admiration or whatever. But um, it, that's why I would believe the translation is. But it is very different. I yeah. I I'm sorry. There are certain people I will not fear. I will I'll show respect to them. But yeah, no, I'm not going to fear them. Yeah, that's a good point. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, and and when um, the um, uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit, if we have fear of the Lord, the old translation is fear of the Lord, but this younger generation. They, you know, that's been de-emphasized, and I don't, I can't, rem off the top of my head, remember what the what the, the the word is now. But okay, for the sake of time, we I we need to move on. Okay, so we're now looking at verses eight through ten. Own nothing to anyone 
except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in the saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no evil to the neighbor, hence love is the fulfillment of the law. And I, I just kind of, I, as we're reading, why we, uh, uh, as a Catholic church, we, we don't proof text. Because they, the, 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 the context within scripture, that one verse is, reflects on the other verse. So like fear of the Lord. And then what's the following? Love, you know? And while, yes, does fear play a part in our loving people? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm gonna, at some point I'm gonna lose the affection of my grandchildren. Um, but it, it, you know, it just, it's a fear that comes, that is complementary to love and not, not contrary to it. That's the word I'm looking at. Yeah, yeah. Um, comments, questions, concerns about this passage? <coughs> no? Yes, no, yes, no? Um, so in, in verses 1 through 7, um, yeah, I'm surprised no one responded to this verse. Verse 1, owe nothing to anyone. Okay, how many people here have debt? Yeah. Um, and and I, I am, I am going to come back to this. But um, so verses 1 through 7 um, talked about our obedience to civil authority. So now it is, um, <coughs> we're, we're turning to um, our obedience in regards to God's authority, to God's laws specifically. And um, yeah, so owe nothing, so, so verse one, owe nothing to, to anyone. Um, in today's world, that is almost impossible. If you are going to, especially as a, a young, younger person trying to get out there in the world. Um, uh, the economics of our, it's here in the United States anyway, um, the economics of, of um, the cost of things and and a lot of salaries not keeping up with that um, it just makes it you have to take a loan out to buy a house you you uh, you know I, I think back again talking about the genre of 19th into the 20th century and being able to order on on the Sears and Roebuck catalog a house for $300 um, and you know, it took several years for you to um, save that much money. Uh, whereas, you know, now my uh, my daughter and son-in-law would like to move into a bigger home, but the but the home, a modest home today, the ones in the neighborhoods they would like, we're talking, you know, close to a half a million dollars. You know, um, so it. it how do you do that without accumulating debt? Um, and so in my, my, my own research uh, and reading on this, because that was my question, I mean, it, how absolute is St. Paul being? And uh, one of the commentaries made the comment, unnecessary debt. And, and that's, that's where I think m many people get into problem is that they carry way too much credit card debt or they carry way too much, um, uh, you know, not only do they have their the mortgage on their house here, but they have a mortgage on their house up north. And then, oh yeah, well we got we want to go south for this for the winter, so we have a mortgage on our house there. Um, and it it's it if the uh, the what I understand to be the teaching of this passage for us in this day and age is the idea that if it is necessary, then then there is no. I use this almost worried to say it, there is no sin in that. 
Um, but it is for us to recognize that getting out of debt is as much a, a part of our Christian responsibility as anything else is. Um, why would you think that would be so? Yeah. So, I mean, that so th th in, in terms of declaring bankruptcy, you know, that is not respectful of the authority uh, of authority because it's it's taking advantage of a loophole right. to everything that's going on. I had a friend of mine that she was engaged to a young man um, who had gone through graduate school, was ending his graduate school. And um, so they, they went and had their, their, their conversation with the clergy and the, the priest and one of the, their meetings, okay, now we need to talk about our finances. And he finally disclosed it. He was at that, and this was, what, 30 years ago? He was $40,000 in debt, credit card debt. Um, and because that's how he lived. Um, that's how he got through graduate school, was he just kept getting another credit card. And in this day and age, you know, I, I, how it's so easy. You know, they're throwing money. If you, if you pay off one credit card, just be prepared that you're going to get inundated with all sorts of, um, oh, we'll give you, we'll you $40,000, you know, uh, credit card, whatever. And if you don't pay the credit cards off, they'll give you more credit cards. Yeah, then that's true. That's a very true. You know, one time I saw years ago on a news station, I don't know which one it was, there was a young man who was And and there 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 was um, I do remember that um, legislation um, uh, I don't remember if it was state or federal um, where it because for a while they were targeting like like yeah. sixteen year olds you know fourteen fifteen sixteen year olds and it became illegal to um, to actually target those younger populations because they were filling it out and, and their, their, their parents were discovering, oh, great, you know, they've racked up $2,000 in credit card debt with no intention of ever paying it off or no ability to pay it off. So it, it's that the issue is unnecessary and that, that becomes something that, that we all need to reflect on on a regular basis. Uh, and because we're also in this situation where we want stuff and it's so easy to get it. <coughs> One of my favorite um, TikTok reels that I, I see every so often is this, this couple. And they, they um, buy stuff from Amazon and they test it out for you and let you know if it's worth any, if it's any good. And some of these things are so clever. Okay. And, uh, and every, I thought, oh, I should get that. Oh, I don't, I, I don't need it. You know, can I stir a pot by myself? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, do I need that little gadget that stirs it for me? No, you know. Yeah, 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 the one thing, yeah. So it, <coughs> it's unnecessary. We need to keep that in mind, unnecessary. Um, uh, um, and then, but the, the more important uh, idea there in verse one is accept to love one another. That's, that's the only thing. Um, and that is the idea that, that our, um, our loving fulfills all laws. Okay. And we've talked quite a bit about the whole idea that, that of the, the, the 300 and the Ten Commandments, which led to 300, or 613 um, individual laws, you know, and then Jesus's two laws. Jesus's two laws sum up what God intended for all of the other laws, and that is to train us in a way to love. That's what it always comes down to. It train us in the way to love. And then we get into verse 9. So, um, which... Ten Commandments are, is he citing there. He doesn't cite all ten. He cites basically 
four, five. So seven is one. Okay, so in order, uh, in verse nine, it's the sixth, the fifth, the seventh, and then when he talks about covet, that would be the, the ninth and the tenth. And it's the, again, it's the whole idea of our relationship with our neighbors. These, you know, the, the, these, these commandments are meant to direct how we are meant to, uh, in some cases, by looking at the, what we're not supposed to do, um, how we're meant to love, okay? So, oh, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, adultery, murder, steal, covet, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what it comes down to. And I, you know, I, every time I, we come into this kind of a conversation, I always think about my mother, because when I, I remember having a conversation with my mother in, in a quandary of what to do about something. And, and I said, you know, you had five kids. How, do you, how did you handle having five kids? And she said, she goes, you know, I, I loved you. And, and um, I may have done wrong, I may have done right, I don't know, but I figured that in the end, what, people would rem what you would remember is that I did it out of love. And that's, that's kind of been the basis of my mantra in most of my life decisions. Um, and then we get to verse 10, um, and basically what he is he's saying in verse 10 is he's saying the same thing, but just from a different perspective. Love does, does no wrong to the neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Okay. Um, last comments and we'll get into our, our last one. Okay, putting on Christ. So we're looking at verses 11 to 14. And do this because you know the time. It is the hour now for you to wake from sleep. For our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is advanced. The day is at hand. Let us then throw off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves properly as in the day, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in promiscuity and licentiousness, not in rivalry and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the desires of the flesh. One of the things I, I, I'm appreciating about the uh, letter to the Romans is that this is at the end of Paul's writing process. You know, it's one of his last letters. And you can, you get, you see things that he has already written about. So what is, who can tell me what this passage, putting on Christ, what, what does it remind you of? Ephesians. Ephesians 6. You know, put it, um, a, the, being a soldier for Christ, you know, put on the, the helmet of peace and, you know, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But any, any comments, questions, concerns? Anything that struck you in this passage? Um, okay, so in verse 11, uh, besides this you know what hour it is. Uh, so when, when St. Paul is talking about the hour, and in Scripture, in, New in the New Testament specifically, the hour <coughs> usually is in reference to the end of all time. <coughs> um, uh, when, in, in reading some of um, St. Paul's earliest writings, um, he talks about things like uh, one of the passages that a lot of people get frustrated with and confused about when he talks about, you know, wives, uh, you know, don't get married. Or women, men, don't get married. Um, and if you are married, then don't act like you're married. And because in his mind, his understanding when Jesus says, I'm coming, I'm coming back, just wait for me, I'm coming back is that it was gonna happen in their lifetime. And so if, if his, his the, the writings reflected that, that, that um, and more than just that passage, it was, it's the whole idea that if you knew that Christ was coming back tomorrow, I, I don't know about you, but I'd be in church in prayer, you know, and you know, waiting for that moment to come. So when, he's taught, when he says here, besides, as, as, besides this, you know what hour, that, what hour it is, 
Um, now is now is how it is the is full time for you to wake from your sleep. So he he is. We, he, he's stepping back away from that. It's going to happen tomorrow to recognizing that it could be multiple generations before Christ comes again. But in truth, every one of us has our hour, do we not? Um, there is a day. It's not written. We, you know, we don't have an expiration date on anywhere on our body, so we don't know when. And because of that, we have to live as if Today is our, we have to, how does it go? That We have to plan like we have tomorrow, but we live as if today is the last day of our life. <coughs> um, and, and that's basically what, what, what he's, he's doing here, is, is reminding people that they need to do that. And, and you'll kind of notice in this whole passage, he, this idea of lightness and darkness, you know, the light of Christ, the darkness of, of sin. Um, that, and then with verse 12, speaking of which, the night is far gone, the day is at hand. Let, let, let us then cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Okay, um, So that, the, that um, for those of you who, are, who walked with me when we were doing um, the book, uh, the Gospel of John, um, you know, the, the images of darkness and light and... Um, are very can be very powerful, um, but he the you know again this comes from Galatians one of his early works. Um, now the works of flesh are manifest, and so what are the works of darkness? Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, licentiousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variances, emulations, wrath, strife. You get the idea. I, I, I feel like he's like he wants to make sure no. Oh well, you didn't say stealing, so I can steal. <laughs> You know, that would be that would be a junior high class. <laughs> um, uh, as, uh, as I have uh, also told you in time past, that which they do, which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So, you know, he's he's he is without going into this this listing. He's challenging the, the, those in uh, the Roman Christians and us today to to recognize Okay, if you haven't, today is the day you got to start. You know, don't, don't put it off. Um, but the other is one of my absolute favorite passages. Um, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You know, this, this, this idea of putting on the armor of Christ. I, I have some, uh, some friends that I know that this is, you know, their morning routine is that they, they, they really stop and think about each one of those and, and, and you know, put, imagine themselves you know, holding their Bible and holding the sword of truth, and um, you know that that this idea that we're meant to to truly put on Christ. When I for anybody here ever, ever make a Crucio? Anybody here? Okay, I used to I used to. Uh, so Crucio was a movement that came out of this Mexico, I believe, and it was for adults, and it was an evangelization process. And it was very popular in the, the 60s and the 70s and uh, 80s. And they still do them to, to this day, but it, they're not like they used to be. And I was um, uh, on the team. And, uh, and the reason I share this is because for the longest time, I started doing this when I was, was on retreat. And, I, and at that time, I was living and working in north central Louisiana. I was living and working with high school students. Are working with high school and youth ministry, and I, you know they didn't care if I wore makeup, and so I'm in my painter's pants and my overalls and my you know hippie clothes, and uh, just hanging out with the kids. But when I when I was with the adults, and I would that's the way I would be because most of them knew knew me from that. Um, uh, but when when it was time for me to do a presentation, then I would go back to my room and I would get dressed and out you know in like adult clothes I guess <laughs> and I'd put on makeup 
And this is what I would, would be thinking. You know, I, I'm putting on you, Christ. I'm trying to put you. So physically, I was, was acting out what St. Paul is calling us to do, emotionally, spiritually, you know, to put on Christ. Yeah, 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 a priest getting dressed for Mass. I, I had a, a, a priest friend of mine that he, so there are specific vestments that they, but he always wore an apron. The first thing he put on would be an, an apron. And, and it, because it always reminded him that he was to be a servant to the community that he was serving. You know? So, you know, I just, inc yeah, that in, in, our, in, in our individual spiritualities, we all have our unique journeys. And for some people, you're, looking, you're thinking, well, that's just stupid. And that's fine. But for some of us, having that, that, that cross in our pocket, that, um, that stone or that statuary or whatever. I, I, I sometimes wonder, because remember the day when you, for us Catholics, we'd have a little Mary or Joseph or St. Christopher that stuck to our dashboard. I, I think we would all drive a lot safer if, that, if there was a reminder, you know, that, that these things help to remind us. I also think too that in, again, in our homes, you know, every room had a cross or a crucifix. Um, that we um, that there were statuary and, and there were visible, tangible connections to our faith. And I think more of the young families, if they had those things in their homes, that maybe there would be more of a connection. So never stop giving crucifixes and statuaries for for baptisms and and first communions and you know you may never see them again, but. You never know. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then in regards to verses, um, verse 13, um, let, let, let uh, us conduct ourselves becomingly as in the day. Um, you know, again, the, the whole idea that let us, that eyes are watching us. You don't know. You're in the grocery store. You're far away from church. You, you, or you're, you're, in traffic, you don't know who is in the car next to you. So when you know when you get so angry and upset, and, and it's, forgive me, but you give somebody the finger, and you look over and go, "Oh, there's Roger." <laughs> oh, sorry, Roger. Oh, in the car next to you, you know, you don't know who's watching you. Before, um, before I got in my younger, more reckless days, when I would do things like that, my wife would say. You better watch out, somebody's going to pull a gun. I said, well, don't worry about it. He said, I am worried. They're going to miss you and get me. Yeah. <laughs> See, and what I, what I thought you were going to say is that, that you know, you've got to be careful because you don't know if one of your students, you know, one of your students is watching. But, yeah. Um, okay, and then in, in verse uh, 14, the, 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 you know, the summary statement, um, and, and this is in regards to summary of what we, what we have been talking about through this whole chapter 13. You know, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and if anybody was respectful for, to authority, it was, it was Jesus. Look at what Jesus did in his final moments. You know, he, I, I could just, you know, he's the son of God. And he's standing before Pilate. And Pilate says, you have nothing to say. Part of me wants to say, Jesus goes, poof. You're, <laughs> I'm out of here. You know, you're God. That's, you know. He, he had ultimate authority. But because God had placed Pilate as the authority in his humanity, he, had, he showed respect to that. Good point. Absolutely good point. Yes. Yeah, see, you know, you have no, you know, you have no authority except what God has given you. Yes. Yeah. But it's it's like, you know, so putting on the Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate garment that we are meant to wear. Um, uh, uh, in, in term, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Unless someone wants to have the final comment. Well, the desires of the flesh. That's what the society's all about. Yeah. Desires of the flesh, that is definitely what this, this, our, our world is all about these days. But all the more reason that we need to put on Christ because 
we need to be a model and living example to the world of, of what, what truth, <laughs> I almost feel like Superman, truth and <laughs> justice is, you know, the American way. Yeah, yeah. but you know, that, that's, especially for, the, for our families and for our friends, you know, that I, 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 there, are time, there are times when I, 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 I know I'm talking myself blue in the face and, and my family is not listening to me. But I, I want to, if, uh, when I die, I, I, I want to listen in on my siblings. Yeah. I want to listen in on, on at the funeral luncheon. Yeah. <laughs> Be careful what you say about me, just so that you know that. Uh, because I, I, I'm, I'm, my thought is, is that, okay, what, I, they're not listening to me in life, that maybe they'll, they'll look back on my, my life in death and realize that I was making a very powerful statement. That's my prayer anyway. Okay, so with that, let us pray. Um, and I would like to begin by praying uh, for the repose of the soul of uh, Bishop Gumbleton, um, who did give so much to the church in his tenure as deacon, priest, and bishop. Uh, so in gratitude for his service to our church, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And what else shall we pray for? Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. No, she's not here today. I'll be the voice of her. For me, uh, Maureen Transom, until he gets a job. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for all of those who, um, for whatever reason, are not able to be here at the study, um, that they know that they are missed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, and for those prayers that rest deep within our hearts, let us pray to the Lord. Lord hear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> um, we give you praise and thanksgiving for all that you have given us and are to us. We ask, Lord, that in this coming week we can look at our attitudes and actions uh, towards those who are in authority over us, um, that help us to be aware of, of our thinking and our, when we are right and in our thinking and actions when we are wrong. Um, help us to reform our ways because our ultimate goal, Lord, our ultimate um, desire is with every passing day to become more and more like your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We, we don't want to just put on Christ. We want to, as much as we possibly can, become like your son. These things we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. And we end um, by acknowledging that you are God, our ultimate authority, our only authority in truth by saying, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And we end as we began, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.